Hello again. I want to talk today about governments and why they're so keen on scaring their citizens with bogeymen like terrorism and coronavirus. There's no conspiracy theory here. One of the chief reasons that men and women get involved in government or politics, whether at national or local level, is because they like power. They enjoy bossing other folk about. Obviously some do it for money. Uh, where I live there's a lot of corrupt associations between local councillors and builders and developers. Money changes hands. But the chief reason is busybodying. People like to have power and tell other folk what to do. Probably the best reason you can have for getting people to do as you say is to put the frighteners on them. If you make them nervous about things, some threat, an imaginary threat usually, you can get them to do what you want more easily. The quotation at the beginning of this video was from an American journalist called H.L. Mencken and it was made in 1923, very nearly a hundred years ago. I just want to repeat it for you. The whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Now the coronavirus is a brilliant example of this. It's a fantastic way to scare people and so acquire more power over them. Um, but the particular hobgoblin I want to look at today is terrorism. Now we've all of us given up a lot of our liberties in recent years because of the threat of terrorism. This applies to America just as much as it does to the United Kingdom. The reason that we're so um, well quiescent in this is because we're assured two things. Firstly, that the threat from terrorism today is unprecedented. And that's a word that you've probably heard in connection with coronavirus as well. Unprecedented is a word that people often use when they're going to present you with something quite normal and they want to pretend that it's a new thing. The other thing about terrorism that we're assured of is that it's very, very severe. It's a dangerous threat to us. Neither of those statements is true. They've caused us to give up a lot of freedom. And I'd like to look first at the idea that the threat from terrorism today is unprecedented. One of the worst terrorist attacks in British history took place in 1867, over 150 years ago, when a quarter of a tonne of explosives was detonated outside Clerkenwell Prison in London. This was a simply enormous bomb, which demolished a stretch of the prison wall 60 feet long, knocked down a row of houses and killed 15 men, women and children. To give some idea of the power of the explosion, here's a surviving section of the prison wall. Imagine a bomb big enough to blow down 60 feet of that. The government response to this terrorist attack was led by Benjamin Disraeli, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, but would become Prime Minister the following year. I want to quote what he said. The, the Prime Minister, Lord Derby, was fairly ineffectual and let Disraeli have his say in matters. Disraeli wrote, Many of the miscreants who are to perpetrate these crimes are now here and are known, and we can't touch them. I think habeas corpus ought to be suspended. Now that's got a very familiar feel to it. Disraeli organised troops to be mobilised. They took over parts of the capital. Um, guarded public buildings and so on. He didn't get his way about habeas corpus, which is a good thing. We've probably, most of us have seen today that there are calls for habeas corpus to be suspended or even done away with because of the threat of terrorism. I might mention that in the current virus crisis, people seem to be willing to follow any mad rules and obey any illiberal laws simply to keep them safe. The Clerkenwell bomb had been planted by Irish terrorists and they were responsible for a very serious campaign of bombing in the 1880s. The Tower of London, Scotland Yard, Houses of Parliament, 
It was at this time that the first bombs exploded on London underground trains. Irish terrorists weren't the only ones at work in Victorian London. In 1894, an anarchist was killed trying to plant a bomb at Greenwich Observatory. Three years later, another anarchist bomb killed the first person who ever died as a result of bombing on the London Underground. This was in 1897. In the years before the First World War, the suffragettes set off bombs all over the place, including one which exploded in Westminster Abbey. Among their targets was Roslyn Chapel, which some of you will know from the Da Vinci Code. The suffragette bomb exploded there, damaging the fabric of the building. The first terrorist bomb of the 20th century exploded in Northern Ireland in 1914, planted not by the IRA but by the suffragettes at Christchurch Cathedral in Lisbon. I don't suppose many people today remember that in 1939 the Irish were planting bombs again in Britain. They killed people in London at railway stations and in the summer of 1939 five people were killed at Coventry when a bomb went off in the city centre there. The reason I'm mentioning all this is that terrorism is always presented to us as being a new threat, an unprecedented threat, something that we must tackle and we must be prepared to surrender some rights in order to deal with it, to make us safe. Okay, terrorism has been a feature of life in Britain for centuries, so it's not a new thing, it's, the threat isn't unprecedented, but perhaps it's more severe than these earlier examples of terrorism. Let's just think about that for a moment. In the last 10 years, 35 people have been killed in Britain by terrorists. That's less, fewer than um, four a year. Yeah. Over those 10 years, on average, 49 people a year have been struck by lightning, making about 500 for the whole decade. That means that the chances of being killed by a terrorist bomb are about a tenth of that of being struck by lightning. In other words, you're 10 or 12 times more likely to be hit by lightning than to be killed by terrorists in this country. It's about as likely, um, how can I put this, about roughly as many people are killed each year on average by bees and wasps as are killed by terrorists in Britain, three or four a year. Which means that the threat is not severe. So in that case, why are we told that danger from terrorism is so unprecedented and so severe. Well, it's not a conspiracy theory here. We don't have to worry about Bill Gates or the Rothschilds. It's simply what Mencken called the whole aim of practical politics, to keep the populace alarmed. Crises are good like that, because they mean governments can take any measures that they want and people will roll over and accept them as we have done indeed with terrorism in the last few years. This is why we should be frightened about all the new laws which are being passed to deal with coronavirus, as well as those laws and regulations that would have been pushed through to deal with terrorism. We are always told that such laws are temporary measures in response to an emergency or unprecedented crisis. It's a lie. How do I know this? Well, it's really simple. I've seen it all before. I know how the trick's pulled. And let me tell you, let me explain to you what goes on. I'll give you two examples. When I began drinking in pubs in Britain in the 1960s, the pubs closed at half past 10 at night during the week and 11 on Friday and Saturday nights. And they always had to close during the afternoon. We took it for granted. That was a situation through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It was just part of life. Closing time for pubs was 10.30 at night. I wonder why that would be. Hmm. I'll explain. When the First World War began in 1914, a broad law was passed called the Defence of the Realm Act, and it could be amended and bits could be added to it whenever needed. And at one time, Lloyd George, who was a teetotaler, got it into his head that munitions workers were getting to work late or taking days off because they were drunk. At that time, pubs were open at all different times. 
So he decided to add a little bit to the Defence of the Realm Act, saying that pubs had to close at a certain time in the evening and had to shut up shop in the afternoon. And incredibly, that went on for a hundred years, even as late as the 1990s and the early part of the 21st century, pubs in Britain were still following the emergency laws passed in the First World War. Yeah, exactly. The second example I'll give is this. The terrorism crisis that we're currently suffering has been going on for, well, at least a century and a half, probably more like two or three hundred years, but still. In 1974, a terrorist bomb exploded in Birmingham in London, in, uh, sorry, in Britain, killing 21 people. The Home Secretary then, Roy Jenkins, immediately pushed through some emergency legislation called the Prevention of Terrorism Temporary Provisions Act. And again, he said that this was unprecedented. It was to tackle an emergency, that as soon as the emergency was over, the law would be abandoned and that it would be renewed each year and scrutinized by Parliament. 26 years later, that law with its temporary provisions was still around. It was still the law. Every year, Parliament had passed it through on the nod. There'd been no discussion. It simply renewed the Prevention of Terrorism Act, passed to deal with an emergency that has long since vanished. This is what's going to happen with the coronavirus laws. In years to come, they will still be around, they'll still be renewed annually, despite all the sunset clauses, and we'll get to live with the consequences, just as we do with the laws and regulations that have been brought in spuriously to deal with terrorism. The whole purpose of politics is to have power over people. And the easiest way to do that is to keep them nervous and scared. And anybody now who's feeling nervous and scared about coronavirus or terrorism is falling right into that trap and they'll put up with any sort of assault on their liberty. And they'll exchange their liberty for a little bit of safety. And I think we all know what happens to people prepared to do that. <laughs>